And we're back. We're live with Gloria, um, who uh, just uh, showed us around her builds in The Sims, which I thought was such a cool thing to do on stream. And uh, now it's time to ask Gloria some questions about uh, folklore and other stuff. Gloria, are you ready? No. Good. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, before, Good we, answer. before we get into anything, I always want to... Uh, I always want to thank the uh, intrepid and trailblazing this week. Folkwise interview sleuths who help us put together these questions. Uh, Glory, if you uh, like a uh, question and you, uh, uh, it makes you laugh, it makes you smile, it makes you go, huh, good question. You do not thank me. Thank the sleuths. They, uh, they, they, they really, I think, did a good job on this. They, uh, uh, they had some good ideas. They were really, they're really getting into it. But this first one, I think, is real good. And, and I kind of giggled the whole time we were playing The Sims when I realized this was happening. So we just did all of that in The Sims and never defined the term vernacular architecture, which is cool. I don't think anyone has defined it on the show before. You might be the person uh, who is uh, best equipped of anyone I know to define vernacular architecture to, a general, uh, to the general public. So, hey, Gloria, how do you define vernacular architecture? There's various definitions for it. I believe one of them... Oh boy, I'm going to misquote people terribly. <laughs> but one of the main folklore-friendly definitions is ordinary people. I, Pravina um, uh, Shukla uses this one a lot in class. Ordinary buildings made by ordinary people. Mm -hmm. um, another definition could be traditional architecture. Um... Traditional as in um, based on historic cultural traditions from a, a particular place. Um, Non-architecture designed buildings could be another um, definition. It's basically everything that gets left out of architecture school. Um, buildings that are, yeah, it's literally buildings that are designed by... By people through their traditional knowledge of construction. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the way that I'm using it or looking at it, I'm actually looking at uh, contemporary structures or modern structures. So the opposite, imposed buildings, but mm -hmm. how people use vernacular traditions to modify them for their cultural needs. Let, let me try to follow up on this right now because I think this is the time to get into it. Um, now that chat knows what vernacular architecture is, can you recontextualize some of the things you showed us in The Sims? Of course. Go for so it. The first, the first three buildings I showed you are buildings that one can... Not those, but you can find something similar in the Puerto Rican landscape when you are driving, when you're walking around. The two wooden structures are traditional styles um mm -hmm. casas criollas or creole style buildings that do combine spanish um caribbean mainly spanish and african influence um mm -hmm. to to make these uh puerto rican buildings you will find similar styles throughout different parts of the caribbean and latin america the the one that I, the first one i showed you the one with the carport that is a mid-century modern uh, style that has that was brought to Puerto Rico with the design of subdivisions, these huge sprawling subdivisions that started with uh, the Levitt uh, brothers and other U.S. companies and corporations uh, that were developing uh, and bringing moder modernity to the island. And I think this is part of why I associate so much with the Fallout games, because <laughs> the Fallout universe is kind of stuck in the 1950s modality for 200 years before yeah. the world goes to shit. Yeah. And Puerto Rico is like in the 21st century, but a lot of the principles, the worst principles from the 1950s are the ones that stuck. Mm -hmm. And one of them is this architectural style. And so what I'm looking at with that building I showed you is how people take the carport, which is very much an American invention for the car and do everything but the car. Yeah. So that's kind of the long and short of it. So that's kind of the context for that. Uh, the old San Juan is also, those buildings are based 
even though those were very rich people buildings. Um, that's where a lot of the fancy families that did very terrible things during the 17th, 18th, 19th century, where they had their city houses. Um, these were, a lot of them were landowners and a lot of them were slave owners, you know, so it's not the best history, but those were rich people houses, but the buildings were not designed by architects. They were built by master builders hmm. using Spanish and Mediterranean principles that kept houses cool, uh, especially near the Mediterranean where the temperatures were hot, hotter. There's a lot of, um... Uh, Islamic um, dis um, principles in the cooling of these houses as well. That was, was brought to the Caribbean and actually worked out really well in those buildings in old San Juan. They're still very cool and very nice to be in if you ever get the chance. So um, yes, like history obviously is never simple. It's never, f I like to, you know, bring the ugly with the, the nice and, um, and uh, just put it out there and you know, celebrate what we can of history, but also like not try to hide the shitty part. Yeah. So yeah, um, you know, classism, racism, all that stuff. It, it's it's part of history everywhere. There, yeah, there's like um, a physical record of of that. Yeah. Yes, there is. There is. Um, the the building typology that I did not include in The Sims was the boio or the indigenous uh, straw wood wood and thatch buildings and mm -hmm. oh my god i don't know if any of you heard danny the cat who's running behind he's gonna start being chaotic in a second oh good um, he, chat's he gonna went, love that he saw the cat he, he just went to the bathroom and i can feel it so if you give me half a second please while i clean the litter box or else this is going to be torture I, <laughs> hey i understand um <laughs> mood 30 seconds mood, mood. i'll be right, All right back let's put 30 seconds on the clock uh Shirley, and keep reading. No. Shirley, uh, how much of B movie do you have memorized? Um, start it off. Start it off. According to all known laws of aviation, uh, there is no reason a bee should fly. Uh, its wings are too small to get its fat little body off the ground. Uh, however, the bee flies anyway. Um, and and uh, that's it. That's all I know. That's off all top you my got. Head. That's all I got. Unfortunately. I mean that I know what happens, but you know <laughs> what? And what happens next? I need to know. Do you like jazz? What happens next is is that the uh, I am it's back. B time. Gloria's back, and chat uh, completely understands. They're the cat owners of chat are like, oh yeah, I have the same issue. Um, I'm a bit yeah. concerned because Danny the cat just disappeared. Oh, I saw. Uh -oh. I saw him jump off the stack of books. Yes, he is somewhere. I that's the problem. Um. If you want, Loki, come here. Come here, little guy. <gasps> this is my other assistant. Oh, this hi, Loki. Loki, <laughs> Loki Pokey. <laughs> he is my desk assistant, and now he's going to want scratches all the time. As he should. Thank you. Thank you, As Death Lords, for the bees command. It was the perfect uh, cap off to Shirley's monologue there while Gloria was away. But Gloria's back. Bees? And let's get, let's, <laughs> let's get into your second question, which is about uh, your current job. And uh, that is, Gloria, uh, you're, you currently work as a historic preservation program manager for the city of Bloomington. Could you uh, chat a little bit about what historic preservation is and what training uh, you get to pull from your very varied backgrounds in this uh, position? Of course, no. Um, there you see them both now. They are oh, on screen. That, yeah, the bit. The, thank you for the bits. Uh, more bits for that. We've got two animals in shot. It's, 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 bits for Gloria's it's, framing it's, of the it's, pets. It's, yeah. It's, 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 it's. So, so um, yes. Yeah, so I studied my undergraduate was in architecture, and then I did a master's in historic preservation. I worked in Old San Juan for, for various years with the historic buildings. Historic preservation is basically what it sounds like. It's an architecture and historic sites-based uh, field. Not everybody who works with historic preservation is an architect. There are lawyers. There are um, builders. There are chemists. There are all sorts of people who work with the... Uh, making sure that historic buildings. Oh, look, Danny's doing a uh, a, a good big stand. Oh, look at that lad. Yeah. A great. Well, shape. he's do he is doing mischief. 
Um, <laughs> yes, I know what oh, he's wow. up to. So, see, so he wants attention because I'm giving Loki scritches. And Hell yeah. So, yeah, historic buildings, uh, making sure that they are still standing. Uh, if I learned anything in school, it was that water will cause all sorts of damage. So, damage number one is water. You just have to try to figure out how to prevent water getting inside. That's where roofs come from. Uh, um, 99% of buildings in the world have roofs, but not all. Uh -huh. That's another conversation for another day. But yeah, roof uh, water is the source of all evil for buildings. Uh, you just have to make sure that water doesn't get into pores or rots things or destroy things. Uh, the other thing is if you maintain buildings, you don't have to do all like huge restorations. Um, so maintenance, maintenance, have a year plan, a five year plan. The older the building, the more you have, to, you have to know how to take care of it. So that's, that's basically the type of work that I decided to specialize in. And also unlike architecture per se, there's less of an ego because you are mm. seeking to preserve other people's work. You're seeking to, uh, do something for a greater community. Who are your stakeholders? Are they your neighborhood? Are they your family? Is it the planet Earth? You know, is this a UNESCO World Heritage Site? Is this the local distillery? It could be both, or it could be something very personal to a smaller community. So yeah, there's a lot to unpack. There's a lot that you can critique about the field. There's a lot of reevaluation and analysis. I actually came to folklore because I wanted to do a PhD in historic preservation, but that did not exist at the time. There is a program now at Columbia University, but that did not exist when I started. So mm, through historic mm. preservation, I'm actually wanted to look at some of these principles as well. Sorry, through folklore, I wanted to look at some of these principles as well. So yeah, that's kind of what brought me here. Um, I've been in the academy for way too long at this point. I need to graduate and um, continue on in the academy or continue on in the public sphere or both. Mm -hmm. I love both. I love teaching. So even if I were to stay in the, the public sphere as I am now, I wouldn't mind teaching courses at night. I, I just love it. I love it. I, I, I love interacting with people and getting the word out there. Um, so I, yeah, I applied for this job in summer, uh, last summer, Miguel, he, my husband is in the history department. He mm -hmm. is doing his PhD as well. And, oh, Danny's like by the door giving everybody a, a look at him. Um, <laughs> they're hamming so up he's, for the camera. I love them. They really are. And, uh. The history department got an email that the that the city was looking for a historian, but Miguel said, like, wait a minute, this is your job. This yeah. is what you studied. This, this is, is everything you've ever done. Yeah. And so it turns out that Bloomington in particular, because there have been so many folklorists here who work with historic preservation, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of vernacular historic districts. So the near yeah, west yeah. side. Uh, McDowell Gardens, uh, Garden Hill, these are all historic districts that are made up of primarily traditional architectural styles of the Midwest and the South. Um, so I felt that I was like, yes, I was particularly <laughs> equipped to work with this type of field. And, and so far, it's been beautiful. Um, it's a lot of work. It's, it's an eight to five. I get up really early in the morning to either write or edit or read, do something with my dissertation between half an hour and an oh, hour every day. How early? Uh, so my, I have my alarm set to five, but I never wake up at five. I always wake up Good at 5.30 or 5.40 <laughs> or 5.45. And then I end up working maybe 35 minutes when I can. And that's not every day. Like tomorrow, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's not going to happen. I can, I can foresee this future for myself. Um, you, be kind to yourself. you hinted at this a little bit when you, uh, oh, well, first I should say, I'm sorry for keeping you up late, but you hinted <laughs> at this uh, a little bit when you talked about, uh, no. being at, uh, uh, Columbia, but you've, you've like done a lot in, in like in your, in your career, you've had like, uh, like various different like fields you've studied, various like jobs you've held, and uh, I guess I guess yeah, I guess I'm kind of curious like like what you what all ended up in the tool belt of historic preservation. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, so um, I'm trying to combine everything that I do, yeah. combine the teaching aspect, combine the uh, working with people. I love to paint. I love art. So I've been trying to incorporate my art uh, or drawing skills in in pamphlets and in, in stuff, you know, like drawing building typologies. And um, so I'm just trying to bring it all together right now. Um, I don't know don't want to do like a plug but i like the city just launched its first historic preservation instagram that's a plug <laughs> so i plug did that for, <laughs> so may preservation plug, month plug. uh may is historic preservation month in the united states uh-huh. and uh i thought that you know so just to foster goodwill let's just do a historic preservation um instagram for the city like an official city presence sure. and it's called at historic bloomington so we beat out illinois and minnesota and Ooh, other bloomington take that states. other bloomingtons that is actually very <laughs> impressive for for bloomington indiana <laughs> so at historic bloomington starting to share so it's a site where i'm going to be trying to share uh, more images of the different historic districts we have, historic resources, building typologies. Um, it's still very, it's a, it's a baby Instagram. It just started this week and mm -hmm. we're going to do a photo contest next month. So that's cool. upcoming. Like, yeah, so a lot of fun stuff. Um, so I'm trying to integrate that stuff with uh, serious responsibilities and um managing just doing a lot of the procedural and managing the the very bureaucratic aspects of it making sure the city is in compliance with state and federal regulations uh, making sure that people's projects are being seen in a timely manner making so there's a lot of it that's um it is very close to public folklore it is a public type of cultural work and it is I don't know. I just really love it and flourish. I proudly say I'm a mid-level bureaucrat and I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> I know the feeling. I try to bring the fun into <laughs> mid-level bureaucracy. I associate so much hey, with the show to. Parks and Rec. Um, the thi like the show Parks and Rec is kind of tame sometimes with the things that happen in real life. So, Sure. Yeah, so that's kind of, I don't know if that answered your it does, question. It does, it does. <laughs> I, Danny's kind of half hidden back yeah, there. Yeah, there yeah, 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 move the chair a little bit. Yeah, we got Danny. Loki's back. Okay, uh, next next question now that we can see the babies again. And by the way, you got a, yeah, you got some follows out of, out of that plug just now. So great, great job, at least two. But uh, Gloria, a question uh, that I think you're equipped to answer. What is ArcGIS and what sort of leg up does it give folklorists who know how to use it? Oh, ArcGIS is, ArcGIS. <laughs> is the mappers, the cartographers, cartography, cartographation. Um, ArcGIS <laughs> is like the big daddy of map making mm -hmm. um, programs. You get actually certify in in learning how to use ArcGIS. It is one of the most complicated programs I've yeah. ever encountered. It is not the type of program that you could just. I guess you could just learn on a whim if you're a certain type of person who gets who can like pick up on non-intuitive things very quickly. Um, but you can, if you're into programming, for example, you can actually program many functions in ArcGIS. So if you use Google Earth, if you use Google Maps, if you use any city web page that shows you uh, incoming traffic or the weather or very complicated algorithms, that mm -hmm. is ArcGIS. Those are higher levels of ArcGIS use. Um, but you can, use it in much simpler ways. I actually went ahead and plotted the more or less 200 buildings that I um, documented that I, uh, how do you call it? A building looked? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> while you, I was yeah doing... building looked, I guess. <laughs> yes, yeah, so. Is what a building lookist does? <laughs> it totally is. So I just stared at the buildings. Um, so I went ahead and and uh, 
plotted those buildings and then put the different types of like they the maps turn on and off depending on which ones have carports how they're being used um i think it's a very it's a tool like any other uh it's really good if you are have a lot of complicated data that you want to overlay or even simple data um it's great because something that I learned, I did my minor, my PhD minor in geography, is that maps are, every single map is going to have some sort of a distortion. So you yeah. can calculate what type of distortion you want in ArcGIS. So when you open a new map, the first thing you say is, I want the Mer Mercator system, or I, which system, which distortion, pick your poison. <laughs> Which distortion works best for you or distorts the least for you? Are you showing half the planet? Are you showing a, a, t a town? Are you showing three streets? So, uh -huh. so there, it, it's a very complicated program, but there are courses, cert certificates. I believe you can do like YouTube channels, um, community college courses. And if you certify in that, you can get a really good job um, yeah. for many different types of things. However, for folklore, um, I think some people are already doing this, but I can't, I don't have like exact citations at the moment. I would definitely urge everybody to do a bit more research and figure out what people are doing. But some the people are- The word on the street is that- <laughs> <laughs> The word on the street is people are plugging in a lot of the research that was done, done in the late 19th century and early 20th century with the historic geographic system mm -hmm. into GIS and like things are lighting up in ways that were not expected. That's cool. Um, so that's something that I would like to explore at some point even more. Um, can, can, just you, because... can you one sentence describe the historic geographic method? Cause I don't think anyone has on the show. Oh boy. Maybe <laughs> you can. Uh, I could try. Yeah. It might be very it might be wildly inaccurate. So let's, let's, going let's, from try. Memory. let's try. Historic geographic method was a methodology used at the Oh Danny's being cute. Um <laughs> used <laughs> by folklorists um a minute ago. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. Uh, <laughs> uh to try to trace the origin or try to trace the routes uh, of tra of different traditions, whether it's through material culture or oral narrative um, storytelling. So it, it's it been used to trace how stories, like uh, let's say a hundred stories, variants of a story were recorded over thousands of miles yeah. and different villages and sort of compare how they change from one place to the other and try to see if they all came from the same place or not. I, I think uh, you, you said you could try, but I think like the word routes is very good. Yeah. It's yes. like geographically yes. mapping the route, the routes that yes. changes in it, cultures happen on. Yeah. It is exactly yeah. what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. It's trying to see how historically things move physically from one place to another. Yeah. And, and plugging, and plugging those historic geographic data sets into ArcGIS gives you uh complete um uh, what new uh new ways of looking at these old data sets or or what the th so so from what i understand and again this is not something i'm a super expert in the but whisper it's something on I, the avenue is <laughs> something i want to um explore more in the future and it, it just i feel it has a lot of potential because the more data you input again it's it's a tool to system um, and it's a you, you cut out there can you, can you put you... into other it's the thing you can sh shake up a bit and sometimes oh uh sometimes you might get a bit more in i don't know like something might light up that you hadn't thought about before sure. some okay. details some word uh, especially when you think of the um is that the arn thompson index Oh, oh the, when you have AT, all of these. Oh yeah, chat knows bits. ATUs at this point. <laughs> yes, you played it when off you have the chat knows ATUs. <laughs> part. When you have enough bits and pieces of data, and um, and you don't think of maybe you're thinking or concentrating on a story like on the main characters, but suddenly like the mat may light out that the dog is the only thing consistent in yeah. you know 300 years of history uh throughout 2000 miles of space so that's kind of the thing like uh, with the people from village a village c village c so i don't know there's um 
I think there's potential for it to being very useful. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I think it's fun to play around with things that we already have seen in the past with all of this documentation that folklorists mm -hmm. and, our, and anthropologists have gained. Um, always being mindful and respectful that you are talking about people's culture and it's not just a toy for your use, but rather like how can you honor, you know, the people who whose stories are being um, dissected and extracted in this sort of way. All right. I'm yeah, great answer. I the people in uh, somebody in chat is uh is saying they're like, wow, I really wanna start a deep dive into ArcGIS, but I don't have the free time. But I'm glad you at least give us like a little preview of like you know what could be on the horizon. Yeah. Uh well, yeah, which... but, um peep People, sorry, sorry for interrupting, but people have actually taken Westeros and put it on ArcGIS. Like, oh, no shit, have, really? And other fantasy maps, but you have to create the base. Like, the base yeah. for most ArcGIS is just planet Earth. So you have to create a new base. Oh, my, that's people, interesting. Yes, people have done it, and I think there are, like, other planetary projects for Mars and other planets as well. You know, I don't really, I don't really know how you would do that. Like, I don't know if the equator... Like, if the equator in Westeros is Dorne, or if it's the Summer Islands, or what? You know? That's a, that's an interesting thought. Like, like making the go. base for... Oh, are you linking it? Yep. Yeah! RCIS Stopping home. the interview to look at this. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Oh I am really, so thank sorry. Thank you so much for sharing that. Dom and the forest. Um, if you want to, like... Oh, and Anazonians oh, yes. in chat. I saw that. You, you gotta look at this, too. Oh! <gasps> Oh well, my god! Wait, wait, wait! Can I open it in the in the map viewer real quick? Okay, okay. I'm gonna go to. Hold on, hold on. Uh, <laughs> Gloria, give me a second because I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen so you can see it. Okay. Oh my god, this is so freaking. This is what I needed, like from in my post con depression, you know. Um. Okay, everyone. Gloria, you can see. You can see. Sorry, important things in life what look at this this is so cool oh man so what, we're looking at all uh, the dots are like uh are like castles and towns right i assume like let's zoom in on what i assume is going to be heron hall here and you can see the fingers heron hall yep wait you can see what about the fingers like the i think it's the geographic yeah up here, the fingers. Yeah. Yep. Uh, here's here's the King's Road. Uh, let's go. Let's go find Storm's End. My. Uh... Oh wait, no. Now I'm. Wait, did I click on Storm's End right? I don't know. Actually, now that I'm, uh, I'm canonically now your own Greyjoy. Let's go to the Iron Islands. Oh my God! Look at this. It's so fascinating. Dude. Um. Gloria, I you, believe, are, you are just absolutely speaking my language here. I believe you can use ArcGIS online to plot things as well. You can use, there is a um, Google Maps tool that you can use to plot things as well. So if you don't have time to deep dive into the complexities of like deep ArcGIS, there are still a lot of ways to mess around with maps and have a lot of fun. Do you see that the Great Sand Sea is a body of water? That's a, That's an interesting... Uh... Like kind of hmm. bug. <laughs> yeah. This is oh, okay. this is so cool. The, the Thousand Islands. Here's Ib. Uh, you are Lang. Are you Lang? <laughs> are you Lang or you or I don't. Ugh. I don't remember. There's a comment on it from three years ago. It just says I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm just I am the same right now. No, this is this is the this is this is the sand sea, and this is the Dothraki sea, the Great Grass Sea. They're uh, past the uh, the Bone Mountains, which wasn't on your non-canon uh, HBO made map, James Dalton Bell. That's why you don't know it because yours ended right here. <laughs> um, okay, we've we've also assumed some things about the shape of Sothorios, but I'll allow it. Uh, cool. Let's go to a shy. Oh, I, got, I gotta get back to the actual interview. Okay. <laughs> hey, Dom, do you need me to take this away this from me? Take just this went away off from the rails, me. Oh, and I God. am okay with it. I am okay <laughs> with this going off the rails. This is great. This is what we're here for. Uh, 
Gloria, that was okay. That was so cool. I'm glad we got a little diversion there. Okay. I legit have a next question for you though. Yeah. And it is the AFS uh, Notable Folklorists of Color Project. What is it and how were you able to uh, enhance it with your own contribution? Lost you there for a second. Oh, hello? Yes, I hear you now. Okay. Okay. You froze. You froze on my end. I think chat, oh, we're no. good. We're good. Shirley? You got yes. us? You got us both? Okay. Yes. I asked about the uh, AFS uh, Notable Folklorists of Color project and uh, what is it and how you contributed to it? So this is a, a, the Folklorist Notable of, um, Notable Folklorists of Color mm -hmm. is a project that has been taking, it, it's been taking place over the last few years mm -hmm. and it has been spearheaded by some uh, really important uh uh, curators, um, Dr. Phyllis May Machunda, Dr. Olivia Cadaval, uh, Norma Cantu, Sojin, Dr. Sojin Kin, um, and many other really amazing uh, people. And it was, uh, it started up, like, I actually just pulled up the web page so that I don't mis misquote, because my role in this is kind of small, but it's also one of the most beautiful things I've gotten to work on. So this this is a project, a collaborative project that's been been taking place over the last few years. I don't know exactly how many years, um, but the first exhibit was in the Baltimore conference, uh, AFS meeting mm -hmm. of two thousand nineteen. Was it? Yeah. Yes. Oh my God! It's like it's been so long and so short. I don't know. Time time is because it was like a, like like two in-person AFSs ago, but also like an entire lifetime ago, 2019. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Back, back, in back when I met Shirley. Yeah, it was my AFS. first AFS. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sweet. So, um, so that the exhibit marked the 25th anniversary of the cultural diversity committee. It's a committee mm -hmm. that works with, um, cult, uh, folklorists, uh, that have been sort of on the margins, mainly due to um, racial, ethnic, uh, being racial, ethnic, underrepresented minorities in the United States. And so the particular component that I worked with, uh, they're actually working on expanding this project quite a bit. And I am hoping to go to AFS this year in Oklahoma to talk about the project with um, some of these other really, really yeah. amazing people who are the spearheaders of the project. So I came in as um, as a student who des desperately needed work and they gave me work for two summers and were really wonderful about it. Cool. My main job was to create a functional bibliography of the first 25 folklorists mm. of color with as many of these. So these are they're called ancestors. These are folklorists uh, in the field of folklore who wrote and published, and some of them published more than others, um, or who navigated the world of folklore in a slightly more academic environment, mm -hmm. or who contributed to the academic side of things, and who many of them contributed to theory, but weren't, I never saw any. Of, like to be honest none of them were ever taught yeah. um except maybe one or two when i was studying folklore so the pro my side of the project was simply to create a bibliography that other professors and students could use in the future that was put in a giant google document and um they're working with publishing that and making it accessible to communities so that people can uh use these bibliographies as a starting point. The second half of that project, the first year I worked on it, was to try to find as many free, uh, freely sourced or accessible PDF or online sources with, with, these, with, with as many works as possible so that they could be more accessible to different communities inside and outside of the academy. So that was kind of what I did. Um, and that list has been expanded mm -hmm. uh, with 75 additional folklorists. These are all people that have passed away, some of them recently, mm -hmm. some of them a long time ago. And, uh, and uh, it, again, it was the same thing. It was mainly just trying to compile as much of a bibliography as possible and put them all in a, the bibliographies in one place. So some people had pretty decent bibliographies. 
in Wikipedia of all places. So what I do was cross-reference if it was from Wikipedia, just make sure like, you know, fact. Uh, and others were much harder to find. Some of them that have university web pages or university archives at different institutions. But I and some of them just didn't have anything. Some of them published three things, but worked in folk arts festivals all their lives. Yeah. Some of them pu published music. But these are all people who contributed in one way or another. And as I was working on this, I was learning about how complicated some of some of these folklorist lives were and navigating within their own communities, being insiders and outsiders because they were part of the academy up to a certain extent, but not depending if they were in the early 20th century. Um, many of them were extraordinarily marginalized. So they were part of the academy, but also ostracized. Many of them were also navigating complicated community uh, interactions. Many of the indigenous scholars from the from what is now the United States um, ah. were navigating very precarious spaces, both within and outside of their community. Like, who were they recording this information for? Was this information that was going to stay within the community? A lot of it was published outside and often through non-indigenous editors uh, a lot of the verbiage became very problematic so so these are complicated histories and yeah i'm just glad that it's starting to like this project is bringing a lot of it to light because uh there has been representation for a long time it's just not necessarily put in the forefront um but it's it's very important work and very good that they gave a let a grad student do it like you like you said that needed work you know like yes uh, yeah a very yes uh, you, you want to be me... very proud <laughs> they they actually um had some emergency afs had some emergency funding in 2020 during the I remember this. worst of worst of the pandemic and they hired quite a few graduate students who literally like that kept uh kept our our refrigerators with food Sure. And yeah. it kept our apartments and houses lit and, you know, us drinking water. So um, kept a roof over our heads during some of the hardest times of the pandemic. So I am incredibly profoundly grateful. And and I, I do get emotional because it is a very yeah. beautiful, I think it's a very, not just beautiful project, but I think one of the the most important things that I've participated in for like a greater community. So yeah, that, I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up because it is a beautiful project. It's Absolutely. ongoing. Other people are working with it at this moment. Um, there are different levels to it. There's a lot of collaboration amongst many scholars and yeah, it's a work in progress. So it will be like if you go to AFS this year, there's going to be a panel on it. I hope to participate. I already like paid my dues and and the city I'm going to go as part of my training for the city. So I'm going at, at an official capacity. Cool. Um, Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So, yeah, that that's kind of where things are Hell at. Yeah. Uh Shirley, what do you think? One more uh, serious question, and then we got uh, a little a group of uh, of fun ones. Does that sound good? Yes. Does that sound good. All right. Um, yeah. Let's let 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 us do get into this though, because I think you can speak to this as uh, as well as uh, or better better than a lot of uh, people we have on the show though. But uh, what has your experience been like doing your dissertation research as an ethnographer working in the community you grew up in? That's a, actually a very, very good question. Thank you, sleuths. I, <laughs> I actually went to um, visit uh, Rebecca Dirksen's uh, teaching ethnography course um, for the ethnomusicology students mm -hmm. this semester uh, to talk about that and uh, to talk about field work. Um, and it is... It, I already wrote a lot of thoughts. I don't know if they're going to make it into my dissertation sure. or not, but I did write a lot of thoughts um, because being from my community and doing research within my community opened a lot of doors and closed as many doors. Mm. Um, so I placing myself as a woman 
um, in a conservative family and region and place in the world that's also very technological. So, oh, look at that. I have a cat. Oh, I'm great. Put him right here. Oh, now you want to so, be on the show too. Or maybe not squirming. He's like, no, let go of me. I'm resisting so much. I resist. Okay, okay, fine. I'm going to go. <laughs> cat butt. Blessed by cat the cat butt. anus. <laughs> cat butt. <laughs> so, wow. He's so fluffy. Um... So, ironically, I'm working with transportation, with car, in one of the places with most roads in the world. And uh, it wasn't until my 30s and living in Bloomington that I myself was driving. In mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, about 50% of drivers are women. However, I've also found that if a man could drive, then the man drives. Um, there's a lot of little unspoken rules. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Death Florist, he is a very sweet pancake. I call him a marshmallow pancake. <laughs> marshmallow pancake floof. Um so yeah, so so there there was a lot. Like uh, when you are part of a community, you are expected to know the rules of that community, what places you can and cannot go into. I, my main sort of uh, informant or interlocutor, depending what term you want to use, was actually my mother-in-law. Mm. Um, she opened a lot of doors, closed a lot of doors as well, because she's very protective. Um, but she was also a school principal for most of her life. Oh, wow. Um, so ever, she knew everybody and, and we actually went to quite a few, um, neighborhoods where people would get a little defensive. Like, why are you building looking at my building so much? And then they would be like, oh, wait, aren't you so-and-so's sister? The one who was a nurse? Yes, yes, I am. Or aren't you, oh, I'm the son of the cousin of someone who studied at, you know, with you. Um, so that cr opened a lot of doors and, mm -hmm. and really brought really wonderful conversations. But if my mother-in-law didn't want to go to a community or didn't feel comfortable in that area, like that just did not happen. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um... So, yes, a lot of doors open, a lot of doors closed. Um, a lot of, I am one of the wider Puerto Ricans. Um, you know, it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm very pasty. Being in Indiana has made me pastier. So when I would go to the island and say, I'm doing research, I could say it in Spanish, like, mm -hmm. That I'm doing research. I'm at Indiana University. People would ask me where I was from. The moment they knew I was Puerto Rican, like they were just like, oh. And so like, oh, you're one of us. You're not someone we want to impress anymore. You're 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 one like ass. You're like you know, you're another family member. You're not some you're not a guest. Mm -hmm. or like the difference between family and guest. You're not a guest that we're going to be hosting yeah, yeah. or that we're going to be showing off or that we're going to give a particular performance for. Oh, you're you're just another like sibling, you know, the you know, like whatever. So people would like drop formality or it, it was really interesting because mm -hmm. even if you are from a place and you study your own family or your own neighborhood or your own community, the moment you leave for the academy and come back, there's already a bit of otherness. There's already yeah. a little bit of displacement and you see everything with a slightly altered look. Suddenly I was hearing and listening to all of the sayings and the jokes and the things people would say and wanting to record everything in a different way than I would have like a year before when yeah. it was just normal speech. Suddenly every speech became research speech. Every building i started looking at it in a different way and so even when i've been back to puerto rico for christmas or for you know for my own for relaxation i can never 100 percent relax i always see things a little differently oh like look at the fruit vendor look at how they organize their things look at the assemblage <laughs> um, look at the color patterns look at so suddenly everything the the landscape becomes texture in a slightly different way the sounds become knowledge the mm -hmm. lore 
and and suddenly I want to be the person documenting and making sure that the, and suddenly I become very concerned with traditions disappearing or what is being heightened. So part of my dissertation is like what sort of traditions are heightened and encapsulated and preserved and institution like preserved by institution uh, like the Puerto Rican Institute of the Culture versus what is yeah. ignored because it's considered too mundane or too daily, like putting a hammock in your carport. So, so those are Which some is one of the, the questions. first things you mentioned when we were doing the tour in the Sims was the hammock yeah. in the carport. You did mention that. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, and so something like a hammock here in the States, you think of it as a vacation, uh, as like summer relaxation, but the hammock is an indigenous form of bedding mm, mm -hmm. in the Caribbean and mm -hmm. in a lots of parts of what we now know as Latin America. So that there is a much deeper cultural tie there. It it is it was the main bed form, if you were lucky enough, um, up until the mid twentieth century for many poor families. Yeah. So so there are more profound historical ties, and I'm also positing that this carport space is is being used as a transition space, like what the bate or the earthen floor out of the yard used to be for poor families where most of the daytime habitation would occur outside, not indoors. So, so there are deeper cultural ties that I'm trying to explore in that regard. Um, but also as somebody like, oh, uh, you're going home, you are home. So um, you have to deal with things that happen at home. Um, and there's a lot happening in Puerto Rico right now. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but it has been very overwhelming, yeah. very extraordinarily overwhelming. Um, and not just the things you like come to mind immediately. There's like 20 other layers of shit that have been mm -hmm. happening. So balancing out real life, what's affecting me, what's affecting my family, the fact that I cannot move to Puerto Rico if I wanted to yeah. at this moment. Um, the fact that I do consider myself part of the economic diaspora makes everything sort of more urgent, more serious. There is fun in what I do, talking about festivals, <laughs> talking about weddings and carports, talking about uh, people's happiest memories in this place, but as always tinged with bittersweetness of of what is what does the future hold for us for for us as a community as people even as i'm trying to define a spatial spatial usage yeah gloria incredible, uh, that, that incredible was a lot <laughs> answer incredible answer i love that answer Amazing. Um, let's okay. Let's please get into some fun questions real quick. <laughs> yes, Gloria. I don't just... think it's a good start. I don't think it's a good start off, but I really want to do this one. Oh, that's that's the lead into the tier list. Don't worry. Okay, cool beans. Uh, so, uh, Gloria, uh, you describe yourself as an interdisciplinary maniac. Can you explain what that means? I like I like all the things. <laughs> and I collect oh, hobbies. Move. And I feel like I'm also collecting disciplines. Hey! Oh, the whole last mood. You get to my, use a lot of them. <laughs> my, I, right now, I feel that where I'm at uh, with the work I am doing and with the work, and even just being here with all of you tonight, I'm being able to combine. Uh, well, tonight, I was able to combine architecture, preservation, folklore, uh, gaming, art, all the things that I love. So I do try to. I sometimes feel that I'm scattered and that I'm a wisp in the wind, but then I think, no, there's always a, something a north, something tying me between the arts and between my love for for buildings, uh, for for making things, for for problem solving. So all of these things do come together, and and I love teaching and sharing that. So yes, I sometimes feel that I collect hobbies. I I I am a lapsed flautist at this point, but I do love music. I do love um, painting. I do love crafts, um, knitting, um, and doing. Oh, like I don't know. I I love different types of hobbies. I just don't have time for them. Um, the same way I love different type of interdisciplinary work, uh, combining things about geography, things about architecture, interior design, 
So there is a theme theme of space, but also of creation and of um, talking to people. I kind of want to start a Twitch stream too now. Do um, it! <laughs> I would love it. I just don't have time. Our pilot. <laughs> I this don't our have second backdoor pilot. <laughs> yeah, our, oh yeah, a, a new backdoor pilot. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a year, like maybe in a year, oh, yeah. maybe oh, yeah. if I ever finish whatever I'm writing right now. All right, chat, so, chat. After next ice and firecon, I will, I will, I will check up on back here the one year. Of this. Yeah. yeah, at some point I want to write fiction, but I don't have good stories or do a comic book or something. So I do love creating. I do love putting things out there. Um, I have worked as a book illustrator. I actually have some samples of like so. Um, I made this for the School of Music, mm -hmm. so th this is actually for uh the the CD design for an actual CD that's real. It's so cool. <laughs> so, um, so and I've worked uh on design for um other sort of things. Um. um or just draw all day and paint um but also whenever i do that stuff professionally um there's more stress than fun so there's always that balance like what is stressful what is fun but to be honest the work i do during the day in historic preservation is really fun um oh deviant art you'll see all my really old stuff <laughs> i mean That's i've been scrolling through it it's all really good ah <laughs> Hey, no, this um, actually this actually leads perfectly into the next question I have, which is which medium of creating art is your current hyperfixation? Painting in pink and blue with watercolors. Oh, very specific. Go on. Very specific. Yeah. So I had never had like that sort of hyperfixation before with just two colors, mm -hmm. but um I've just been give me a second. Ooh. Uh, there's these two there's colors more. that I Ooh, really love Gloria. Um, Ow. and sorry, you can't really see these well. No, they're, they're, you can see them pretty well. Of, Those are gorgeous. Yeah, a lot of them. This is just doodles. A lot of these are posted on wow. Instagram. Wow, but you don't get a sense of the scale. Oh yeah, the Etsy shop is partially closed because I just don't have time. Oh but, well. Um, <laughs> I ahead. wish I could just live off Etsy, so but cool. um, right now I think there's a strike against Etsy as well. Yeah. So yeah, this is my yeah. pink and blue hyper fixation. That is I love so cute cool. Things. That is phenomenal. Cute things, but also like slightly magical, slightly morbid. Um, a little bit of life, a little bit of death. Um. I kind of want to secretly, like, um, yeah, write all sorts of fiction as well. Um, um, but I'll probably not talk about uh, things that I want to do. Um, so, yeah, these are, like, other studies that I've done, like, of pre raphaelite Whoa! Shit God, my God. Um, what did you say? What did you say? Surely shit God, my God. <laughs> so, I don't know. This oh, is what God. I do for fun. This is one of my baby brothers who's actually, uh, I, I'm not going to plug him, but I kind of want to. So one of my little brothers is, uh, his job is he's a ninja pirate hunter that protects the president and it's accurate, but he doesn't like, he's uh, basically, um, Coast Guard special ops, but oh. he's literally, so he Whoa. took this really badass oh, picture yeah. in front of the statue of liberty i'm not a like a big gun person but i thought it was kind of a, I mean, like it's your just like yeah <laughs> movie like movie um that's the poster you know yeah, yeah movie video. poster so I can, this is from perfect spacing yeah. yeah actually oh my god yeah and, and he One actually man. is like his job is to be yeah no he his job is like mostly classified but he does work in new york city right now wow so um yeah so and he also wrote a fantasy book because that sort of stuff runs in the family um so yeah so so that's kind of but my hyper fixation has been painting let me give you the colors in case any of yes. you want to like oh this is like the beginning of bob ross give me the colors names <laughs> so oh i'm using ultramarine finest horadan schminke like 
Okay. And uh, Permanent Carmine are the Ooh. two colors that I've been using the most. This is really fancy watercolor tubes. They're very expensive. But, oh, my God. Like, every time I paint with them, I just, like... I can, I can see. Joy. <laughs> and so what I do is that I... I refill this. Oh shit! Oh shit! It's kind of wet. Nice <laughs> <palette. laughs> so you I just put water in it, rewet it, and keep using it so that I can, you know. So lots of purples, <laughs> lots of pinks, lots That's of so cool. blues. There's so many tones right. of purple. So another pro tip: um, if you want to store your paints, um, glass bottle with lid. This is really good for preserving them. Dang. <laughs> Uh, Shirley, I feel like you are very impressed. <laughs> I am incredibly impressed, my dude. That is so cool. It really I'm, is. I'm also into fiction and watercolors, so hey, I'm I'm vibing here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, this is the question you wanted to be asked the whole time, right, Shirley? Oh my god! As soon as this I saw that, I was like, "This is going to be the, be the best the, fun question." This might be the best the question I've ever written in the history of the show, Gloria. I hope you're ready. Okay. He's born ready? Fuck Mary Kill. Tommy Wiseau, Neil Breen, or James Wynn? Ooh. How to choose among so many auteurs? <laughs> Do we have to explain who these people are? I know I two of them. Oh, oh, and the who's the one you don't know? You, James Wynn? Uh yeah. Birdemic Shock and Terror. Okay. Yes. Now I do. Okay, okay. Okay. Um so in terms of sincerity, okay, so in terms of productivity. So there's different categories. Like mm -hmm. let's let's parse this out. This is parse important. These three This is a very amazing This is a uh, very uh, uh, dedicated filmmakers. <laughs> this is a very important um question you're asking in yes. terms of um like, who do you want to live with and create more art with? Oh, who do you want to just oh, no. have like a passionate fling with? And who do you want to just kind of not be on the earth anymore? That's how I would interpret it. <laughs> well, I was actually going to say like, who's most prolific? Neil Breen. <laughs> Neil Breen is the most pr uh, prolific. Yeah. Um, that like, oh. uh, that's but, not the question, but it's, it's his own category. Question, yeah. Yeah. So the, question, the question is fuck Mary Kill. <laughs> I think that who's your the, favorite. So, okay. right. the, I think that the most passionate is definitely Tommy. Mm -hmm. Um Tommy in every so creator, regard. creator of the room. Yeah. Creator, yeah, I, star, writer, I, but, director. <laughs> I yeah, because I think Birdemic is a bit more self aware. Yeah, Bird Birdemic, Birdemic, I think they know that they made something weird, yeah. And that's cute and charming in its own way and very wholesome. Um, I think that both Neil Breen and Tommy Wiseau, um, oh, geez, I don't want them to, like, come after me or anything, but they are a little bit too sincere and they are very problematic in their stances with women. And, yeah, oh, um, oh, oh, oh. And, um... Uh, they're so, but they're very sincere in what they want to believe. But um, Neil Breen's an architect, by the way. That's right. Neil Breen is was an architect. Representing. Representing. Um, that gives him. I don't know if that gives him extra points or takes away twice as many. Um, but yeah, um, I would say like in terms of like person that I would actually root for the most, I would say Birdemic. Um, James, James Wynn, yeah. James Wynn, yeah. And actually, now I'm thinking of um, of interviews that I have read of him, and I'm sorry I can't remember his name. Um, he's he just seems like the nicest one of the three. Yeah, and I've he, met he Tommy Wiseau, like, a, like an egomaniac, like the other two. He's yeah, like little, and I he's have a off, but he's not like I've a monster. met Tommy Wiseau um, oh. at at a screening, and. Um, and he, you know, he was very polite. And mm -hmm. actually, um, I don't envy the position of one as a, like, because I am a creator too. creators, uh, whether they're architects or artists or whatever, have very frail egos <laughs> and are very delicate and their world can be popped and crumbled so easily. So I do not envy the position that any of them have been put into where they've strived so hard to do something so seriously and then it's yeah. just 
like gone off the rails completely Blacked and like they're the rest of time yeah yeah but mm-hmm. i mean like like you watch it and you can't think that, like how is this not a parody but it's not like this has to be a parody this has to be a parody like this yeah. cannot be real and it is real and you, you, like and, you're saying you're right birdemic <laughs> is the only one that kind of approaches that kind of approaches yeah. that um it, and there's there's almost yeah. like a sweetness to to like making a dis- disaster movie with such terrible effects and knowing that they're terrible there's mm-hmm. a bit more self-awareness that you're trying to do something very ambitious but the technology you don't have that access to technology and well you know you just go with it yeah. um it's not Sharknado either. Birdemic is much more sincere. Sharknado's just is kind of a, a riffing into all yeah, of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, it's it's the one that's slightly more self aware, uh, and I believe that he actually like went and announced it with a megaphone. But uh, I mean, I don't know. I feel like the three of them. Um, Shirley, to answer your question, the three of them would lead me to a life of a solid and celibacy in a cave if I had to choose. Uh, okay, so I, I feel like we asked, we asked the classic F. Mary Kill, and it's be friends with James Wynn and then a vow of celibacy to never see Tommy Wiseau and Neil Breen. <laughs> Basically, oh uh, basically. Oh, I'll, I'll um, allow it. Congratulations. You know what? I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, because you're right. Like, at least, like, with, like, with, like, James Wynn, it's like, you know, they, like, there, there, there is a, a, a movie. Uh, I don't know. I guess there's a movie there. There's, like, they tried to do special effects. They put, like, animated GIFs on top of the footage or whatever. But it's not like Neil Breen and Tommy Wiseau, which are basically like, record me shouting in a room for two hours. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. There's yeah. There's, there's a certain and kind of, like, cynicism, like, to having yeah. to be in someone who's sitting there, you know, saying, or both I can't them, believe you like, killed they... yourself. I can't, I can't believe, you know? That's got to be so weird to be in a room and... with that guy. <laughs> yeah, and I've also been unpacking this much longer. Like, I don't know if it's being in the Academy too long or... Or reading more um, about how people react. To I still love um, reactions. Um, for example, not Dom, but the Dom on YouTube who um, does it's book reviews. I'm the Dom on Twitch. I'm the Dom on Twitch. <laughs> yeah, but the YouTube one, British accent guy. Oh, I think um, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. 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 He he did a. a an April Fool's video of of the the book because he does um, lost an a show called Last Lost an Adaptation, which is when um, like yeah, he reviews compares books and movies and how they're different. So he's like, well, how was the Room Lost an Adaptation from its original Polish book? It was kind of like the premise. <laughs> um, it was amazing and magical, that's and I deep, laughed. That's a deep cut off. reference, honestly. Yes, yeah, it was no, yeah, amazing. It's a, a pretty good oh, and, one. And I still love watching either clips of the room or or things like that, but I'm also aware that it, like he he his portrayals of relationships, like there's a lot of unpack really problematic. Yeah, yeah. And gender roles and um the the effects this had, like Just the way Lisa. that even the fans treat Lisa yeah. and the the act, even the actress who's just like so miscast and such a sweet person. <laughs> yeah, that's what. Yeah, uh, Juliet, Juliet Michelle. I did hear she's great. Yeah, but but she's yeah. the, kind of the 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 focal point of Tommy Wiseau's like misogyny for an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel very similar vibes with Neil Breen, where um, oh, he yeah. hires all of these out of work actresses, and then like they both do the same thing of having like these actresses either very scantily clad or with no clothing, and then they're just like using this money to uh, I don't know. It just just gives me a vibe. But um, that said, uh, yeah, celibacy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Shirley, or Shirley, how does it feel that I finally have uh, someone who can talk so bad it's good movies with me on the stream? 
I think we we made Shirley escape for for their life. Is Shirley gone? Is Shirley gone? Um, um, the chair is empty. Oh, oh my God. Um, well, hey, I was going, to, I was going to ask my co-host if they wanted to do this uh, next bit, but I'll, I'll start it off. Okay, I will say this, Gloria. All of this was a preamble. Oh, Shirley's back. Shirley, Shirley's back. back. Shirley's back. Okay, sorry, we put you on blast there. I asked you a question. And Shirley, then I learned you're you were back. Gone. Sorry. No, I, I, I did the. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. I, I'm back. No, you good. just happened to do that when I asked you a question. Never mind. Oh um, fuck. <laughs> I have that nightmare. Um, I was. Well, I'll. I'll. I'll do this next part. I'll do this next part, uh, Gloria, and I'll ask you, Gloria, have you ever made a tier list? I personally have not. I have seen other people make a tier list. <laughs> well, I. I think it's about time we get into it. Have had, have had, 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 had